before we start, we've got public comment. So if anybody in the public has anything to offer up that has, doesn't have anything to do with what we're about to talk about, uh, this is your time. So does anybody in the audience tonight have anything they want to share? No? All right. So first up, who's uh, walking us through this? Uh, signs, we're starting with signage, blade signs. Wayne, is that you? You can. So this is just, you know, there's always an interest in merchants downtown having no signage for the buildings. Um, although we actually have not heard any complaints or concerns from merchants for a number of years. So it seems like we've found the right balance between not too many signs and serving merchants. But there's a growing trend in a lot of cities about the so-called blade signs. Um, and cities usually like them. I mean, obviously merchants like them because it makes their business attractive. But they're more focused because they're narrow signs, they're small, they're really focused on the pedestrians and not on cars, which mm -hmm. I think is what we want to do. Um, so we began discussions just a couple months ago about is there a way we could do blade signs. We've been looking at other communities, most notably Brookline, because they spent, frankly, a lot of time doing research on doing this. And so the draft or did you pass out the ordinance? Mm -hmm. We emailed it, yeah. Okay. yeah. So the ordinance you got is heavily borrowing from Brookline. Certainly the square footage is borrowing from Brookline. So the idea of not do not these are non lit signs the way we're defining them here okay. uh, and small signs but the idea that these would be extra signs so you could do a, a blade sign over and above whatever else you're allowed to do we're still playing with whether it should be three feet or four feet did you talk to louis no he never got back to okay. me on that so we're thinking the width the width of the blade should match the the width of um awning signs and frankly i'm not exactly sure what awning signs are so whether it's, you know, how far they stick out from a building. Match, match you know with where? the what with sign? An on, like an awning itself. How far out no. from yeah. building. the building. How far it projects. So if you have a right. triangular awning, mm -hmm. so that distance, it would go under an awning, essentially, maybe have it the same. I mean, I don't, we wouldn't do more than four feet, but assuming an awning is not more. If an awning is more than four feet, it would use four feet. Yeah, that it seems deep. The, de the depth of an awning seems deeper than you would want for a, <clears throat> yeah, a sign, especially sticking out on, okay. a, on a sidewalk. Right. Yeah, yeah that's. It's up That's high. Absurd. That's it's still, up high. It seems crazy. I mean, <clears throat> okay. so a blade sign, you can, you can have a, a, it just means perpendicular, basically, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Perpendicular, but typically it's turned at 90 degrees. So typically the long axis is what's Then it's thing. not perpendicular. If, if this is the face of the building and you're yeah, walking yeah. down the sidewalk, it's perpendicular. It's perpendicular to the building. To the building, mm -hmm. yeah. But it's, it sort of sticks out more like that. Okay, saying okay. The, the long dimension goes out. Okay. But yes. Okay. Oh. And so the, the only, I mean, we allow these type of signs now. They're, um, they're considered either or. So if you have a wall sign that faces the street, then a, um, a hanging sign or this blade sign would be considered second signage that would automatically trigger a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. And also we only allow one foot projection from the wall. So that perpendicular distance, which is, makes for a small sign, and some people are fine with it. Some people have gone for special permits, but it sort of eliminate. It's because the wall sign has potentially different, um, you know, target um, viewing than a blade sign. Then we felt like instead of putting a barrier there, an additional barrier for businesses that to allow both of them if they fall into these conditions. But we didn't. The dimension. We were just trying to figure out what that four feet would look like. So. Right. We, we began this, as, as I say, sort of stealing from what Brookline did in terms of the, their dimension because they did a lot. But um, So we had suggested four feet. Louis looked at this. Louis has worked the building inspector, and he was very comfortable with it. He thought maybe three feet made sense. It's somewhere in that range of three feet to four feet. Um, I still like the four feet because it makes them longer and thinner instead of being, you know, for that. But, well, is there, is there a... Um, Total square footage. Okay. Is there a total square? There is a total. Square so this footage. this could it could be a bracket with a round sign. It could be a, a, a tall skinny sign. It could yep. be a projecting. That's correct. Rectangle. It just seems like if you take the width of this desk, and you stick it out on a sidewalk level. Uh, that just that just seems deeper than it needs to be. Well, I mean, as hey, Louis' suggestion was going from four feet to three feet. So I. I and I'm comfortable with four feet, but I'm fine with three feet too. So. Yeah. And it's at nine feet high. Is that is that what? <clears throat> I'm comfortable with one foot. Seven. Yeah, just, <laughs> it's, 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 it's nine feet. Nine. Yeah. 
Is this something that there is a crying public need for, or is just somebody sitting around thinking of things to do? You know, it's interesting. I, I, I've been doing a bunch of these panels helping downtowns and other cities, and almost no matter who's on the panel, people who are interested in downtown recommend towns allow blade signs as a sort of a way to make it more vibrant. Because the signs that are really focused on pedestrians, most of our signs are more visible from the road. And if what we really want to do is make it as pedestrian. Or across the street. Yeah. Or across the street, right. Mm -hmm. 25 square feet. That's a. That's big. That's yeah. the other yeah. sign. Yeah, it's 10, ten signs. That's the one sign. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, you could have one not to exceed 100 square feet, but that's the building sign. Right, so the red, this is on the. the Third page. The red is the. I'd, I'd be really for it if they take down the other sign and put up a blade sign instead. But we're just going to get more signs. Yes. Right. That, to me, it seems like this is a secondary sign. So the primary sign is there for traffic. This is for pedestrian. So it, it's supplementary. But to have a four foot wide sign almost, to me, just the. It's substantial enough to that would be your primary sign. But that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for. <coughs> Yeah, the limit on here is 10 square feet. That's correct. Right. But I'm just saying, even even if it's just, yeah. if it's a foot tall by four feet wide sticking out of the building, it just it just seems awkward. Mark, are you more comfortable? I mean, it's three feet? Three feet is better than four. Yeah. Um, All right, well, let me try this. What about if, I mean, what, would, what I would really like is to have blade signs replacing the other signs mm -hmm. over time. Now, that's not going to happen for existing businesses, but as new businesses come in, if they, we will get blade signs put up when we allow them. And as new businesses come in, we could get blade signs on those businesses in lieu of the wall front signs. And we would actually, in the long run, transition to a town that has pedestrian signage instead of car signage. But it, it, is there a problem with the wall signage? I mean, we, we've had a transition itself. Wall signage has, for a while, it was growing. And now I'd say merchants themselves are limited. We don't, I'm not sure we have a problem with wall signs. Okay. We do on King Street, but on Main Street, I'm not sure we have a problem. Yeah. The other piece of it is if you're walking on one side of Main Street and you're looking for a shop on the other side, the wall sign helps you as a pedestrian and vice versa. So, okay. And you wouldn't be able to see the blade sign otherwise. True. I don't have a problem with the wall sign if the supplementary signage isn't excessive. Okay. So, so I think if, if, if the blade signage, to me, was small enough that it, it, or large enough that it had its intended effect so that if you're walking down the sidewalk, you see three storefronts ahead, that's the store I'm looking for, that's fine. But I don't think you need to hit somebody over the head. So if it was three feet out, should there also be a smaller square footage? Because we did 10 feet sort of based on four feet out, and so how, how high up that could be? Would you want a smaller number there? Yes. I, I, I think so. Yeah. Is there, are there any photographs of places where this is? already exists that you feel that this would be a good thing? I mean, yeah. I, I can't picture. I mean, there's signs now, on, especially on upper floors on Main Street, you know, frame shops or something, where there's a blade sign sticking out of the second floor. But it's yeah, but usually. It sticks out a foot. Right. It's usually a long yeah. rectangle, yeah. a foot. Almost something like deep. a banner. It's almost like a yeah. banner. Like yeah. off the wall or something. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, if they can already do that, then why do they need more? Because a foot doesn't really give you a lot of visibility. If you... Almost it has to be this way, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Limiting as far as. Uh... Well, yeah. I mean, I would question if, if we have any existing blade signs that are that big today. <clears throat> um, we don't have that stick out that far. No. We've gotten a few special permits for more than a foot, but the, I don't recall that they've gone up to, I mean, I'm thinking, I think Woodstar has one that's more than a foot projection, but it's not four feet. It's just a little bit more than a foot. So. Right. Does Brookline have a lot of them at this four foot? So they just passed the So that's not the so. answer. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. I'm sure we could find some examples. Of those different dimensions and bring them back and just well I'm just thinking about the rectangle dimensions and if you want to go three feet I don't think we need a 10 foot square foot limit I mean even a, even a 
six square foot limit means you're going to have a two foot sign. The blade is two feet. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's no longer a blade. It's a rectangle that's fairly. So, um, I mean, I'm, I'm leaning towards a sign that is linear if you want to come out. I can see if, if you came out, you, you could have a bracket. I think I can't. Is Woodstar, is that a bracket with a sign yeah. hanging underneath yeah. it? Something like that. Uh, Which it would be decorative and, and stick out. And that's a blade sign also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just because well, it's perpendicular. Good. Okay. But, but it doesn't have to be you know, sticking out in 20 square feet. I think you could still have 10 square feet and be, you know. Yeah, Deborah, are you arguing in favor or against? No, I, I think I'm uh, leading, um, le leading you all to correct me in, in the discussions. <laughs> <laughs> just feeling my way through it, actually. I, 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 I have in other shapes besides rectangle. Right. They could be circles or right. shield shaped. Or, right. um, I, I think this airs on the side of right. excess, and I'd rather err on the side of, of I small think, or smaller. I think we need to do more homework on this. I think we need to get some conceptualization of what the signs are going to look like, what the worst case would be. Uh, well, and I guess I wonder if, if we're, are we solving something? Have you had a lot of requests for them? Or we haven't had a lot of requests for them. I think it's really more about you know, how do we make it more interesting for pedestrians and more informative right. for pedestrians. Well, and I, I'm, but we've also not had a lot of requests because it's a financial obligation and a permit review. So people might hear the one, you know, can't be more than one foot and then yeah. stop there. Uh, if we were interested in putting up parking signage, is that in any way related to this topic? So doing street signage is exempt from zoning. So if DPRB is doing things, those ugly metal things, those don't need to go through this. Okay. <laughs> if we do it, it can be ugly. I guess I'm just wondering about kind of the order of magnitude. I mean, if you were in a very large city looking down a very long street, I could see where this might be helpful. But if you're in downtown Northampton, you can stand on one corner and see both ends of downtown I, I don't know. I'm just, I don't, do we really need more signage that no one seems to be, we seem to be solving a problem that doesn't exist. You, you know what always struck, this is nothing to do with signage, but I have to say it was one of the things that really struck me 20 years ago when we did this. We, when we did our downtown plan in 1994, so there's a lot goes back on the time, we gave um, a bunch of interns counters to measure how people walk down the street. And I'm always struck by the people who, there was a lot more traffic across the street from Pulaski Park than Pulaski Park. That Smith students coming down would deliberately cross, the storefronts were more alive. I, I sort of feel the same way at Blade Signs. They just, they add a, with, we don't want visual clutter, but we also want visual activity. And I think they add, a, I, I think if well done, they add life to the street and make it more interesting. Um, I see people walk to the edge and then look up trying to see what, uh, what the story is as well. Um, I, I like them myself. You know, I'm usually so busy trying to avoid stepping on dog poop that I don't look up at the signs. <laughs> I mean, going back to Devin's point, you know, if you're asking me where the places that I think of too much signage, it's the um, sandwich board signs. Right. You know, there's a separate thing we've talked about mm -hmm. years ago about using street lights, uh, street posts for sandwich board signs. So they're mounted there. That would be a separate thing. That's not a zoning thing as much. But um, I, I'd I mean, not. So there's a th I have, So if you could be a storefront, you have your, your main sign, a blade sign, and a sandwich board. No, we don't allow <laughs> sandwich board signs on Main Street first floor. We allow them on basement things and side street signs. Side street. Because okay. we didn't. We right, don't right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not opposed to the the concept of, of you know more blade signs or regulated blade signs. I just think this right now is is it just feels too big. Um, I, but I don't know what the, the magic number is. Well, we could either do you know three foot signs and six square feet, or spend more time looking at examples. Either one's fine. We're not in a desperate hurry for this. So, whatever you prefer. I mean, I don't think, I don't think it would, it, would, it would take long. I don't think the discussion would be a long one if we found a couple examples and said, you know, this is six square feet, this is, a, this is a bracket with a round sign, this is a rectangle, and then we could make a quick decision that, okay, six feet is good, 10 feet is too much, or whatever it might be. Um, and since there isn't a driving need, I, I don't, 
I don't feel the need to make a decision tonight. I think we just get a little more information and then make a decision. We good with that? Yeah. Who's going to lead the talk on marijuana? <laughs> There's a blade sign. You could have a big one. I guess I'll start this. <laughs> so, um, you know, we've had discussions for a while sort of thinking about medical marijuana, what are the appropriate places for doing it. Um, I think at least at the staff level, so I'm going to speak this for you all, we're not particularly concerned about where medical marijuana comes in as long as it's in the same places where the equivalent use would be allowed. So you could imagine, in essence, there's three components that you could imagine medical marijuana taking it looking like. One is the growing facility, the growing and processing facility. And this is primarily going to be a warehouse use. The security issues are so strict in Massachusetts that it's, um, it's certainly not going to be a free throwing crop in someone's backyard. It could, in theory, be a greenhouse, but the security requirements of the greenhouse are so strict that's unlikely, especially because they're going to license these things on, on or about January 1st, and they have to have a seed in the ground 120 days. So if you were going to do a greenhouse, you'd have to buy it, you know, build a new greenhouse with really th thick plexiglass. So, you know, so we're mostly talking about the processing is going to be in a warehouse type building. Um, the Massachusetts will require these things be vertically integrated. So who's ever building these, whoever has this has to grow their own marijuana, process it, dry it, whatever they do. If they're going to want brownies, they're going to want some sort of food product that goes in, they have to do that themselves and they have to sell it. So, so one place has to own all those things. They could be in the same site or they could be different sites. The benefit of being the same site is you could have a license in both Hampshire County and Hamden County and have just one growing facility. You have something on this? The disadvantage is this is an expensive product and it means you're shipping. Some appeal from a security standpoint. So, um, and obviously a dispensary could be like a pharmacy, imagine that, where you go and you get you know, your doctor, your prescription, or it could also be, and this is not required in Massachusetts, it could be vertically integrated where you go see X company's doctor who prescribes it to you and passes it to you. Um, everything has to be bagged, so there's, you know, there's a lot of details. Um, and my feeling, at least, is the growing and processing is really fine any place as long as we deal with details of it. Um, and I'll come back to the details in a second. The selling is really fine any place we allow pharmacies and any place we allow doctors. And so I'm, I'm not suggesting any controls other than those things we have already, which is why, we haven't, why you haven't seen this earlier. Because if we did absolutely nothing, the zoning would allow medical marijuana uses and the same things that a similar use is going on. Um, PVPC put together a meeting, a sort of to, to bring in some experts, a couple of lawyers who have a nationwide practice doing this in other states, someone who runs a, a chain of dispensaries in Colorado. And I didn't hear anything that made me concerned about the, um, the location issue, but I think I was struck by the volume we're talking about. So the state's going <coughs> to have a minimum of 19 of these, one per county, and a maximum of 35. The figure they were using is 1 to 3 percent of the population will be buying medical marijuana, where 6 million people in the state, so that's a lot of people. If there's only 19, if there's only one or maybe even two in New Hampshire County, we're talking a lot of volume. So the same thing that makes me concerned about a fast food restaurant applies. No more, but no less for that. And then security issues, I think the law covers. I'm not worried about security issues, but I am worried about um, the dumb security is big cameras moving back and forth and big fences and those sorts of things. And you can do great, you know, banks are a good example. You can do great security and not be ugly. And pawn shops are an example of the other thing. You can do <laughs> great security and be really ugly. And I want it to look like a bank and not a pawn shop. Um, it, it, the third one, this is relatively small, but because they've been growing this stuff um, indoors, they're really high electric users. We've been trying to green Northampton, so one of the thoughts is, they have the right to use, you know, fossil fuel like everybody else does, but the extra bit of electricity that they're using because of the nature of these things, then maybe we should be asking them to mitigate those. So, so what the draft is before you is thinking about, uh, again, not touching the location, which is zoning allows, but dealing with all those details for doing it. Time is critical. Where's the blade sign? There's no hurry. Time is critical for this one because otherwise, wait, people are going to start getting. Um, 
We know there's a lot of interest. A, a few people have been coming to visit us. So there's these five who got li listed in Hampshire County. And many of them, I don't know the answer, are looking at Northampton. And there's one who was listed as, as Hamden County, and they're actually looking up here as well. Um, you know, who knows who's really going to show up? And they're now at the next stage of finding a site. So this is to be um, a closed facility, so you can't see into it. That's correct. So the question of its proximity to schools, for instance, is probably not the same issue as it would be. And the state actually does have some setbacks for that stuff. But yes, that's not my concern. Mm -hmm. Um, because because of those things, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. it is it just so it's clear. When we polled city offices, planning and building were comfortable with all locations. Board of Health did express that concern. They were concerned, particularly about Main Street, that a place on Main Street might feel like a head shop. And I don't mm -hmm. think that's true, given where the where the Department of Health regulations are. But do you want a closed store on Main Street that has no front that has liveliness to it? Well, we require a certain amount of glazing. So you couldn't see the product, but you could do other, you're just as we have lawyers' offices downtown. You could do a storefront window. Um, but there are issues in terms of security. You can't get in unless you have the card mm -hmm. from the state. Yeah. Um, the price of land downtown is going to make that prohibitive. But you could have the warehouse out in Industrial Park, and you could have the dispensary on Main yeah. Street. Oh, yeah. Well, no. the price of land would make Main Street first floor prohibitive. It wouldn't necessarily make it on Center Court or some building on the second floor, you know, where, where the rent's draw. I'm getting a little confused by you talking about growing and processing, and, and, but medical marijuana is, requires a prescription, right? I can't see it being any more popular than other drugs that you need prescriptions for, and people aren't, don't run in every day to fill their prescription. Well, you are making a rise in Colorado. How many people got prescriptions? But there's not as many pharmacies. I mean, there's right. a lot more pharmacies right. than there okay. would be dispensaries. Why didn't they just have pharmacies mm -hmm. sell them? It's a prescription drug, right? Prescription drug, right? I think we have the regulations that we have. I don't disagree with you. But because there's only going to be one or at most two of these in Hampshire County, that's very different than, you know, all the CVSs and right. Walgreens that we have. Um, and, and they can... They can see that. grow it's and dispense in two places, but they have to be run by the same overarching mm -hmm. person. That's correct. Mm -hmm. right. And it's something I don't understand the regulations in detail. You can even have a management company. I think for our purposes, it's one company, it's one nonprofit who owns it. The person who's actually growing it could be a management company, it's someone different. Can, can I read this? Maybe I'll understand it better when I read it. Medical marijuana is a subset of medical uses and medical dispensaries and is allowed in any facilities where new physicians' offices and new dispensaries and pharmacies may be located, but not locations where medical uses and dispensaries are allowed only as a pre-existing non-conforming use, and for any growing or processing without dispensaries in any industrial area. Now, doesn't that mean that pharmacies can sell it? No. Well, from our regulations, this would, okay. but... but Remember who wrote this thing in red? So this is what I'm suggesting for us. Okay. But we don't get to, I mean, the, the health department, state health department, has written statewide regulations. We didn't repeat them because that, that's the minimum floor. Mm -hmm. So the state is licensing us very close. There's lots of details that we're not going into because the state's doing it. But one, one thing is they have all these regulations. You can't get in the building unless you have a card that says you're eligible. So CVS couldn't sell it. Okay. And they also have to be run by nonprofits. So what you're what wanting the planning board to do, a library or something? What you're wanting the planning board to consider is the effect on energy use and traffic? Yeah, so let me walk you through this if I can. So I just want to give you the background. So the first part, what Franny was reading from, is just the definition of what we're talking about for medical marijuana. Um, I am saying the second part, we're not talking about special permits. These would be allowed by right. Um, but it should be site plan approval. So you get to look at those details for doing it. So that's what 11.2 just says is we're looking at these automatically as intermediate projects. Um, the third section, this partially applies to this, but it also doesn't apply to everything else. We've always said for traffic mitigation, so, so nothing to do with medical marijuana for a second. For traffic mitigation, you either do bricks and mortar work to address traffic issues based on your portion of flow, or you pay a payment in lieu of, and we had a formula for what the payment in lieu of was. It was a Supreme Court case that basically says we have to do individual fact-based analysis. So 
we're changing this. The table that said what you had to pay is now the maximum, because we still have the right to have a maximum. <coughs> and you will have to do a fact-based analysis. Our numbers are conservative enough from the city's standpoint that I suspect in the vast majority of cases someone will have to pay that. But we have to do an assessment for each one. Mm -hmm. And you've done this already so that the Bear Hill, which is elderly housing, um, you didn't require the maximum <laughs> because they don't can. think so. Restricted <laughs> <laughs> housing. That's a term of endearment. <laughs> Restricted housing. <laughs> Am I turning red? <laughs> um, so they paid a smaller fee because they could convince they convinced you all, your predecessors, that a fewer percentage, smaller percentage of people living there were commuting during rush hour. So you, you've always done that sort of assessment. So that that stuff in in blue if yours is color on the top of page uh, three, two, is would apply to everything. This is partially to address the, the court case. And we I sent this to our attorney, he may or may not have some changes to that, but we need to do that regardless. The the next thing is setting a, 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 fee, a fee for traffic mitigation. So currently we go from zero in downtown, thousand dollars edge of downtown, two thousand on King Street, three thousand suburban area. I'm basically su suggesting the King Street type model of 2000 is, is the peak. Then we use, we have a, a table that says how much trips we expect people to generate. Yeah. And we need a little bit of work on this because we don't have a lot, but the way these seem to be measured, at least at this workshop I went to, is how many people can you process per hour? Mm -hmm. um, and they were talking about basically it takes five minutes after you, when you come back the second time, so you're not learning, it takes five minutes per, uh, per session. So figure for each cash register, you're going to be accommodating, you know, some number. So we can play with the exact numbers. We do a little more research on that. But they're high value. Again, we're only charging for the one peak hour. So this isn't the entire day's use. This is between 4 and 6 p.m., whatever we'd expect the most number of trips to be done that, that hour. Because that's what we're building our sidewalks for and roads for. And then the next one, this is the, the main discussion, is what are, the, what are the specific criteria for approval, again, the site plan approval. And so what I have here is, once to begin the discussion, the hours that can be open, um, the, the fully dis – I'm trying not to repeat too much from the state, so I'm not really sure we ne even need be, because I think it's required under state law, but at least, you know, it's in one place. Well, can we, I think that speaks to what Ann was suggesting that, uh, and, you know, and you and I hadn't talked about that or thought about it in that context, but I think that could cover, you could end up creating blank walls that way, and it could be from the interior, so there could be a complete, like, like amazing.net, for example, they put a false, you know, well, I mean, that was a requirement in yep. the ordinance, but there's nothing there that says that they would have to do the same thing. Well, that goes to the next one, then. So that's what C is about. So C is, we get security precautions, but as a peer from outside the building, it would be consistent with the character of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So for an area with storefronts, you have to do storefronts. You're not trying to restrict security, but it has to be camouflaged to, bend, to fit in the background. So that's really what that one's to be about. Right, but I think the I, I was I could see that someone would interpret that that only as it relates to security do we have mm, to make it look right. like the rest of okay. downtown. So we can say visual too. And the one I think for B to address what Anne was suggesting I think would be important because all aspects of the use. I mean, you still kind of want to have that inviting presence if yeah. you're on Main Street or even in the entranceway business district yeah. where we're trying to create that pedestrian vibrancy. Okay, that's fair. All right, so then C is sort of related. I, I think you're right about sort of rewriting B, but C was partially about, again, there's the bank security and not the, the pawn shop security. Um, D is just sort of, you know, these typically these people using activated carbon, but some sort of thing to catch the, the smell. And we're talking about not only, obviously, the smell of marijuana, but also, I assume like everything else in the world, you can buy organic marijuana or non-organic marijuana. And so we want to catch herbicides and pesticides and, you know, whatever else there is in there. Um, <laughs> and then the, uh, the electricity use. Um, I did 50% sort of arbitrary. I asked Chris Mason to do a little bit, who's our energy officer, to do a little research since I'm waiting to hear back, but trying to understand its electric use for something different. What I wanted was something that's easily measurable. Solarized Northampton. There you go. I, I get E, or the intent of E, yeah. but isn't that singling out, I mean, what if you're a, a high-end nursery or a greenhouse that requires a lot of electricity or not? 
we're not requiring them to provide right, 50% right, renewable. Right. Yeah, I guess you're absolutely right. I think some of this is these are among the highest electricity uses per square foot, other than manufacturing, obviously, which mm -hmm. is higher. Um, and frankly, because the state is limiting the number of these things, the volume of business that they're doing is so much that you're not going to get any pushback. I guess that's part of the reality. For if you're doing, those of you who have been here forever, Montgomery Rose, you know, that was a marginal business. And if you made them mitigate half their, their use, they would have failed a lot sooner. Right. That's not, that's, this is not, they're not going to blink an eye at it. So mm -hmm. some of it is, is for that reason. Okay. I don't disagree with you, in, you know, conceptually. Okay. That's it in terms of the animal. Now that we've sort of discussed the ordinance, would we want to hear from the public? Yeah. Any other comments? Does anybody from the public want to speak on this issue? No? Okay. Okay. Um, one thing, Wayne, that we didn't talk about was um, in a situation where there might be new construction, what kind of parking ratio would be necessary, um, even if it's, you know, footprint yeah. expansion for central business or entrance business. So if there's that much volume, I mean, I don't know that, I guess central business doesn't matter because we don't require parking, but for entrance yep. business. Yeah, we can, I, I don't know the answer. We can come up with numbers yeah. consistent with the volume. Um, but aren't and, we? And when Carol's saying, in the districts which we don't require parking anyway, entrance and GI, I wouldn't want to require parking for this. In the districts we do require parking, uh, we can figure out what that is. I'm not sure the number, but. Yeah, and, I mean, it may be that because of the, it has to be sort of a quick turnkey, that there will be existing facilities, but I could see maybe expansion right, of an existing right. building or something. I, I will say that while these are very high traffic businesses for where traffic mitigation, you don't stay there for a long right. time. So the parking sure. I don't expect to be the same as something where you stay right. near the base, but you could have a drive through. That's what I was just saying. <laughs> you could have a drive through. I'm gonna, I'm Along with your six pack, right? Yeah. 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 I prefer it to Texas drive through liquor stores. Yeah, right. Oh. Martinez. Drive through gun stores too. It's a wrong comparison. It's, a, it's like CVS drive-thru. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I, I just... I, so noted. I think we're treating this as if it's going to be a retail pot selling operation rather than a prescription drug selling operation. And I just think there's an enormous difference in magnitude of what we can expect it's, it's from the retail standpoint, that is. I, mean, oh, I, I don't know, unless I, they can only sell, only unless you can only buy a supply for one day at a time or something like that. No, you can buy a lot. I mean, with the, what people said in Colorado, and they, they pointed out that Colorado is a little different, that I think the figure is there's 300 dispensaries in Denver alone, <laughs> but that the average person is buying a two-month supply. Um, so, you know, again, that may be different here. Um, I think these rules are more, I think it's going to be harder with the, with the, charges that people have to have and the registration that they have to have in order to do it. I think Colorado wasn't real happy with what turned out right, when right. they first did it. One of the things, and I know there's legislation that may change this, but one of the concerns for a lot of people is at this point you can't use a credit card um, because, you know, federal audit considers this a drug and so the credit card companies could lose their assets. And so one of the reasons security issue is such a big deal is, you know, a lot of cash is going through. that. that <laughs> and that may change, and, and a lot of people <laughs> are very optimistic, good? but it hasn't changed well, yet. Originally, there was a discussion about the banking system not supporting this in, in a framework. How, how has that been solved? Well, that's, that's why oh, that's an issue. Yeah, you can't, you can't get traditional bank financing, as I've been told, and you can't use a credit card um, for doing it. Um, can't Can you help me that? understand, um, E, like where, the, where, it, where that came from? Because it's and how it isn't arbitrary, like when you're saying like a Montgomery Rose operation, yeah. you wouldn't assess it because they couldn't afford it. Uh, just help me understand how this is a sort of an equality. So clause. in an ideal world, what we would have done, and this is what an early draft did for this, said is figure out what the, if, you're, if, you're, if your dispensary looks and feels like CVS, figure out how much electricity CVS uses per square foot, figure out how much uses these use per square foot, and they should be mitigating the difference for, for doing it. That becomes really hard to do, and so that's why we did 50% as sort of an arbitrary piece. Um, it's a new use, so we're treating it differently, and so that's part of the reason we're 
we're trying to mitigate it. You know, the city is now doing a lot of things across the board, at trying to encourage, I mean, including things that you guys have done for, for PV. Is this to, coming out of sustainable Northampton? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Generally for energy. Yeah. Randy. Correct me if I'm wrong, but most greenhouses depend on the sun, and pot operations traditionally have been in attics and in basements <laughs> where there is no sun. So I don't see necessarily pot growing operations that are legal and or maybe I don't know maybe you can't can see, see the light the of day so to speak yeah <laughs> I, I, I just I don't understand why the electricity uses would be so intense because because it's a security think, issue because it's really easy to break into I'm not suggesting you do it but it's really easy to break into a greenhouse <laughs> you get a thin barrier that's pretty easy to get through well, and so make it out of Lexan yeah um, but that, that's the issue you can't do it yeah yeah because it's pretty easy to break into, so most of these are going to be in warehouses with grow lights. Have you not watched Weeds? Fences? <laughs> Pardon? Have you not watched the show Weeds? I, I still don't. Weeds. Weeds. The Weeds TV show. program. I recommend. Just the first couple seasons. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> So are you looking for a nod from us? To yeah, this one I'd like track, to do. Right? You're going to see it again. Well, I'd actually like to vote to introduce it. You'll see it again, obviously, when we come back for public hearings and discussion. gives us a chance to, to Just because the timeline. Mm -hmm. We've talked about a couple, you know, you know, amending B and C. Yep. And adding the parking ratio. Right. Um, I think that's the main thing, the, the visual appearance and the parking piece. Oh, and actually, and we need to do a little more work on the traffic. Generation. That was sort of a very quick back of the envelope. Mm -hmm. So those are the three things that I, that I know on my list before we formally introduce it. And if by any chance you get any more specific information on the electricity use, then you can play with that 50%. Yeah. Sense. Any issues? I have an issue. I just want to go back and summarize where we started with Randy reading the definition. Basically, this business use can can happen anywhere that would have accommodated a medical use and that so in that sense mm -hmm. it's we're not making any grand change to mm -hmm. zoning that's right it's considered and a business that, use and that's why I'm telling one of the things that's considered evil in the zoning world is to use definitions to create the rules that's why we're, we're just saying here's what it is it's allowed exactly where the table use regulations allow it right. what, uh, what's the next have highest percentage on the mitigation for from back to E is there a, just from a for a point of reference? <clears throat> Could you talk a little louder, please? Asking the whole what, board. what the next <laughs> highest percentage is uh, as far as required mitigation. It's electricity. Yeah. Yeah, it could be anything. I mean, I'll I, I try to get a better sense Currently. of Currently. But, but do we have any? Currently. I mean, Currently, we don't. No. No. We do a lot of things for traffic mitigation, but for electricity mitigation, we don't have anything right now. So this would be the first. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. It, it 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 just see it just uh, I don't know if it tastes funny or not to to charge fifty percent just because we can because there won't be pushback. It, also, that's also the wrong yeah. sort of precedent. It's also because and there were really high electricity uses and so yeah I get that but then but then you're looking for a number that has more There's fact more connected it's ground more it's grounded more yeah. in this it seems somewhat arbitrary and again if there's going to be so few dispensaries that they're going to just say yes to whatever we whatever criteria we lay out um, that still shouldn't i don't think we shouldn't take advantage of that situation it should be a, it should be applicable across the board or, or close to it um, so that if there are other operations like a Montgomery Rose or something, mm -hmm. it's I would think it's more in keeping with, with this criteria. Yeah. Well, I mean, frankly, I'd love us to do that at some point. Yeah. You know, who's, who's using more out of their class? You know, I don't want to stop someone who's who's making, uh, you know, uh, cement because cement uses enormous electricity. But I wouldn't mind stopping someone who's who's wasting using cement. Mm -hmm. Sort of thinking right. about those things. Yeah. No, that makes yeah. sense. But. I'm, I'm in the same framework, even kind of bristling about it being a park of traffic mitigation. In that case, we're asking them to um, help us as the city provide services. We're providing, you know, responsible for roads and traffic, so that's our service. I don't feel like we're a utility provider, and so. But 
Oh, I see what you're saying. So that's why this one feels, I'm, I'm kind of feeling awkward about it too. But we have, for example, in Sustainable North Hampton, one of our goals, that, and remember one of our things we look at in issuing permits, is to reduce our carbon footprint by 50 percent by 2040, I think. I'm, um, I'm not opposed to the idea that, that businesses <coughs> by their class should not waste yeah. money and not get penalized for it, even if they can afford to, because in the long run it is a, an infrastructure yeah. production issue. But I'm sort of, this, this is the, we're setting precedent here. This is the first step in that, yeah. and I'd rather it be a, a, a policy, a whole policy that does that rather than this first one. I, 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 I agree with you. They'll, they'll be raised not in greenhouses because it's, they're going to build facilities to do them, and they'll, the security will have them, you know, use electricity. I guess that's the reason I, it stood out when I went to that workshop, because because there is an option. You could do a greenhouse, but most people aren't going to because security issues are so right. great. So I'm more, I'm less sympathetic when there's an alternative way to do it. I'm more sympathetic when there is no alternative and way to do it. Did you discuss, was this discussed at the workshop? Did other people have a way of dealing with it? Were there other numbers that were We didn't out? get to that. The PVC does have a working group that's working on This is really more <coughs> just the educational side of what's happening in Colorado, what's happening in other states, right, mm -hmm. to bring us up to the speed. I mean, it sort of sounds like what you're saying is they are actually like a cement company and that they use more electricity than most companies, but that's, but so then I think that suggests that if you're going to do this for them, you should do it for cement companies as well. Like, but the difference may be that the cement company doesn't necessarily have an option, mm -hmm. whereas... Oh, they, they do have an option. They do. Again, it may not be practical given the, the public health department's things, but one could do this they, as a yeah. greenhouse. Right. Or use solar. Yeah, right. right. And that, that's certainly why I'm not suggesting anything about heating, because I think there's not an option for heating. Right. Whereas the electricity is all about grow lights, which right. you could do. If, right. So. Just, yeah. Looks like that needs a little more yeah. data. Yeah. I have a question about, is it just Northampton that is going to be a target area for these things? Or? No, no, they're looking over the state. You know, and so what's funny, I mean, of course, no, is... I'm in Hampshire County. Well, definitely Amherst, definitely East Hampton. Um, Lots of the hill towns are worried about it. I can't believe they really have a chance of getting it. I mean, it's pretty <laughs> unlikely that someone's going to go to Ashfield. But I think Northampton, East Hampton, and, and Amherst are certainly credible. The flip side of that is, if it, we were talking about any other kind of business, we would be begging for it. I, you know? I want this to come here. I'm very much in favor this year. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it creates, I mean, it, you know, from the true business sense, it creates traffic. You know, it creates coming and going. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but, you know, I think the traffic is good, and I very much want us to get one dispensary, if not two. But just like we make McDonald's mitigate the traffic, you know, I want them to mitigate their impacts. It's not to say we don't want these uses here. I'm actually more concerned about the traffic than I am the energy, um, in that I, I, I think we do have to provide yeah, traffic yeah. Um, accommodation, whereas the utilities will go up and they'll try to fix that when they have to. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're uncomfortable, you can you can drop it. This really does come from the sustainable plan saying how to reduce our carbon footprint. Um, you've been in conversation with other communities doing planning for this and obviously talked to some people about what kind of local ordinances they have. Is this a new idea? Is this our I think so. I mean, I mentioned a couple people who were sort of intrigued by it, but it hadn't come up in their past conversations for doing it. Well, so. we've got sustainable Northampton, and that may be why we f have a focus. That well, and I'm I'm interested more from the policy point of view of expanding the idea to be relevant to other business types. Right. I mean, I'm not opposed to that, but I think if if we're setting precedent here, then the next business that comes, you know, a Montgomery Rose, you know, point two. Are and they going to be, you know, burdened. burdened with the same criteria, or not burdened, but are they, you know, are they going to have to meet the same criteria? And well, if not, well, why not? To that point, I mean, could we not survey the type of business, greenhouses, and come up with some metric that's a baseline or common denominator for that, and then go above that? That would feel better than just pulling something out. And I don't know if there's enough of those. A actually, then you could look at it as if it were a greenhouse except because it has special conditions. So greenhouse level is one thing, except that it has special conditions become a safety, and it can balance out the cost of the safety versus the cost of the electricity. If, if, if there's so much that a greenhouse, so many square foot of greenhouse would use, 
and it chooses to go with a covered one for security purposes because it's an unusual business, then, then that's a choice that's made and you have some basis for making the electricity right. charge. Yes. But what if you are a, say, computer center, data center, where you've got a half acre of, of servers underneath the roof and you have no alternative as far as the construction of the building, but you, bless, bless you, you, you require a, a tremendous amount of electricity. You do. But because you have no choice in how you construct the building, then you're not beholden to the, this criteria. That just seems. That just seems. But in the same vein of that, I mean, if if we were looking to bring in a new um, server farm, and and trying to build in the infrastructure to support them, I would say we would definitely talk about their energy usage. That's that's, that's right. what I'm saying. I, I think it should yeah. be consistent. Or, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think of the reverse. I mean, you know, having been the applicant before you for Florence Fields, one of the pitches we made to you at the cost of forty thousand dollars for us was that Florence Fields would be net zero electricity, and we said that's how we're meeting sustainable Northampton in part is that we're, we are going to mitigate it, and, and and it may not be the same as a set standard, but it'd be nice if people started doing that and saying, yeah, I'm going to try to do that sort of mitigation. Well, I'm not hearing that anyone's opposed to this. It just just make it opposed fair. Opposed to yeah. doing this arbitrarily. Mm -hmm. Well, the other reason, frankly, to leave it at this stage is if we keep it in, and you're not satisfied during the public hearing process, you could always drop it, but you couldn't add it in. So let's leave it in, and you know if you're not comfortable, and when we come back to you in a month, mm -hmm. ditch it. Um, at the moment, I'm missing the 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 metric for how you determine traffic allowable usage there's a there's an engineering document that gives you so the ITE know. right ITE, thank ITE you. doesn't yeah. exist for exactly <laughs> that was going to be my point so how are we going to calculate the traffic for this so we're trying to figure out I mean again this is based on a very quick assessment what the guy from Colorado said which is they process basically 12 people per hour per cash register okay and sort of thinking okay so that's 12 people per hour per cash register let's count the number of cash registers something for employees at the peak hour did anybody count the number of cash registers? Well, that would be with someone come for a permit. You know, if you mm -hmm. if you come in and say I want to have two cash registers, your traffic's going to be higher if you want to do one cash register. So we you know we count for different uses. We count by restaurants, by tables, or by square footage. So it's not unreasonable to count um, by that kind of thing. And, and we can really see busy. They'll add another cash register. Right. And, and we can see what else. I mean, again, this mitigation is still the same. It would go up. Would go up. Would be more, right? Yeah. What, what? What? It would go up the more cash registers you have. You mean after the fact? I mean after the fact. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Well, so I think I mean it's the part we're doing more research on is for California and for Colorado and I guess Washington. Um, you know, there may be little ITE studies for those places that this don't. Yeah, it's not you, been published in ITE. <laughs> but because it's not published, this is new to everybody, yeah. so we're getting our hands around it. But. We should have more to go by than that guy in Colorado. Yeah, yeah, I agree. yeah. So. Well, that's why I said it's sort of a, a marker for now. I think this is sort of similar to the signage ordinance or the blade sign ordinance. Yeah, if, if, if the traffic's what it says it's going to be, maybe we do need those four-foot blade signs to oh, I mean, everybody to. <laughs> I would not. I would vote against recommending this to the city council at this meeting because of the. Additional work that's required sort of, on what we've yeah, seen there. It's sort of half baked. Use a brownie matter. <laughs> <laughs> You've just been waiting to use that since we started. <clears throat> What's the timeline on this in terms of the state? So they're you know, they're taking applications for the next phase in the next month or so, I forgot the exact time period. But in January is what they're talking about announcing. So that and people are now lining up there. Some some people already have a building lined up or under lease and some are now doing some towns have said no. Sometimes I've said no, which instantly a moratorium backfires, which is the state's more likely to allow you to grow your own marijuana if you don't have a facility in your community for doing it. So you may in some ways lose more control in those places. But that's the reason the time becomes so critical that I'm hoping to to tonight it, to go right. forward, right? I mean, just in, in um, the 50 percent thing, um, could and you've been to the hearing and you know a lot more about it than what I know just from the newspaper, but could someone meet the criteria of the state 
and really operate as a greenhouse or would they need to be able to have a commercial operation that is enclosed that is hydroponic i mean my understanding is you could could, could it really be done i guess i'm asking is there really an alternative or is it really only i mean to yeah, meet yeah. all the criteria my understanding and i just don't claim to be an expert in this is it's doable it's probably not doable in the state's 120 wind day window because you'd really be talking a major retrofit you couldn't take an existing greenhouse yeah. you'd be doing a lot of major retrofit <laughs> I'm making this up. Use thicker plexiglass, whatever the process is for doing it. But you couldn't um, even with perimeter security. I, the way it, w it was presented by both the attorneys and, and this place in Colorado is the cost for doing that wouldn't make it worthwhile. Technically, it's doable. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want to go there with it. Um, so you're looking for approval to move this forward. We've identified three or four areas which we have questions on in in general. Um, don't have the specifics yet, but we want to move it forward so you can get ahead of the January date. Um, so we so would, this would move forward, it would go out to public comment. Uh, we, the public would be engaged, and we'd have another opportunity to change it at that time, if correct. it's still in. Correct. And things like the electricity use is easy, because if you don't like it, you can just ditch it. Things like the traffic mitigation, we're going to have to have a final number, whatever it is. Um, but so the one I heard you biggest concern about electricity and that's the easiest to kill maybe the second biggest one you know that the Carolyn's comment about the the visual piece I think it's the easiest to address and parking is easiest to address and the the counting just maybe that's the hardest work for us to do but you would revise this based on our comments tonight and we would bring it back with public comment that's correct <clears throat> I think just to to say again on, on E, on the 50%, it would be easy to just eliminate it next time, but I, I don't know that, speaking personally, I'd, I'd want to eliminate it. I think it, this is an opportunity to have something in there, um, but I don't want to rush it through, and if, if it comes through at 50% and there's pushback, and so we just get rid of it, then it might be an opportunity lost. Uh, you know, this might be an, a, a situation we could take advantage of, as long as we are uh, consistent, you know, with, with what yep. may be coming down the line. And have good data. Right. Could something Except be written guy about um, how, much, how many kilowatts per square foot or some, some way of quantifying it? That's the question I asked Chris Mason to research. So, yeah, so that other companies that weren't growing marijuana but may be using a lot of electricity would also be rewarded for not using more electricity or right. Right. aside from the cost of the electricity using this ITE traffic studies I don't know much about electricity but I don't know if there's an equivalent publication there's some book I open up that says right. here's the ex expected electricity use per square foot I just don't know the answer but um, I mean I don't, I don't that'd be Pandora's box I mean you'd have we talked about a server farm or the uh, hospital or the coca-cola plant or all these different operations that are open all the time with a lot of electricity uh, it just seems the electric you know. company sends me a little plot that says right. you know now they're only doing that for residential and that's an easy category but I could love to think that we might arrive at a point where it would be more nuanced as to the right. kind of operation right. had. Well, well that is one of the things that the energy committee is looking at is not the the cap piece the cost piece but just requiring disclosure so that when you buy a house you may say, or rent a house. Yeah. This house is renting for $1,200 a month. This one's for $1,400 a month. But the $1,400 a month uses no electricity. The one is, you know, an energy hog. Right. Uh, and so that's sort of where they've been focused so far. Okay. Any more discussion? We good? So we're looking for a motion to move this forward. So moved. Second. Second again. All in favor? Opposed? Okay. Next up is design standards for seven plus units. Um, so I, I you know, this is a follow up to the um, adoption of the urban residential district zoning changes. And, um, you know, I, 
I guess the question and the issue on the table is uh, how do you want to proceed moving on this discussion? What kinds of things do you think should be incorporated? Do you want us to do some rough cut of possible changes and come back to you with that? I mean, I, I, we don't have anything for you to look at now, but we wanted to start the conversation maybe get some ideas from you all about what you think might be appropriate based on the public comment about concerns that um, for those projects that are going to be 10 or more units. Can we have clarity? I mean, one of the yeah. first things to do was to provide clarity on the public concerns that mm -hmm. pushed it over that way. Well, <clears throat> so... I, mean, I remember going through all of that, yeah. but not how it ended up. Um, in particular, so the impetus of the conversation really had to do with a couple of lots mm -hmm. in um, around the Henry Street neighborhood or on Henry Street, um, and probably uh, a comparison of some projects that people felt were not so uh, did not fit into neighborhood so well. So the one is um, the, there's a 14 house townhouse project on Hockenham Road that was brought up in a couple of discussions and. Um, so I think that sort of became the visual um, identity of what's wrong and what could go wrong if the same number of units were put anywhere else in that neighborhood. And, um, but after that came up, there, were, there, was, there were, was some change to the design standards required not just for larger construction but for all units, that they had to be compatible with the neighborhood in the parking arrangements, the layout of the parking, breaking up parking, um, the, the way the structures were oriented and the covered porches and um, also the driveway locations for um, these construction projects. So and, and sort of going back and looking at as Henry Street as an example, it's half the size in terms of acreage of that Hockenham Road example. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't necessarily just take the 14 units that were approved on Hockenham Road and do the same 14 units on the one acre parcel on Henry Street anyway. It just wouldn't mm -hmm. be feasible, particularly given the new standards that are required to break up parking and um, maintain open space and mm -hmm. setbacks. Those, de those design standards we put in place in response to the right. when this issue first came up. Right. So, and sorry if I'm jumping the gun, but so why was that not satisfactory? Like, what, what specifically was not satisfactory about that to the folks who were upset about this? Um, I'm not 100% I'm not certain, and I think the idea was that um, perhaps there needed to be more focused discussion about large projects because... Um, there may be other ways to, or additional design criteria for the structures themselves. Uh, let me just back up one and, and um, remind you all that on top of those standards at the, at the tail end of this conversation in front of city council, the councilors incorporated another provision for projects of 10 or more units that required, and it's focused more on infrastructure and the site that the standards you use for development had to be consistent with the subdivision regulation. So that means side, the construction materials, the method of construction, um, the types of things that you that are incorporated into a site. Um, but not planning board approval? Well, these would all trigger planning board approval anyway, because anything over 2,000 square feet automatically not, is site plan approval. Not the same as the subdivision. It's not a subdivision right. approval, right. But, it, but these are, we're all talking about special permits for these size. Mm -hmm. So even when the moratorium's over, these will be special permits. So obviously, where site plan approval, it's conditioning. Mm -hmm. For these things, you will have the ability to say no to a project for doing mm -hmm. it. Um, right. And it, it is special permit now at this point, which it hadn't been before. So, um... Uh, you know, and there are, we're not going to have a lot of large, uh, you know, 10 unit projects in Northampton. Um, but we do know of a couple of sites in the residential districts that are moving in that direction. I mean, the whole redevelopment of the Shaw's Motel site mm -hmm. um, will likely be um, 10 or more units. When the teardown moratorium is over with. Right. right. Mm -hmm. 21, is that, they, they did the math. That could be 21, is that the right number? 
I, I, um, I don't know if it was that many, actually, based on the acreage. I thought it was less than that. But still, they have, there's some number of units that, well, there's some number of units that are on the site, so I don't know how much. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me add one thing that, in terms of the question about the due diligence piece. I, I think there was a wide diversity of opinions out there as to how much we should have design standards. Mm -hmm. And you all were very cautious about going too far in design standards, mm -hmm. and at least some of the pushback, and I can't tell you what this, how much the pushback was they wanted more detailed design standards. And so at least for some people, the compromise was below a certain number, they think you guys did a good job, above they want more detailed. But again, I don't know if that's a minority opinion or a majority. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't clear either whether it was architectural standards right. or not, mm -hmm. yeah, or uh, an issue about massing or so, total volume. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think in some cases it could just be um, discomfort with having anything that's more than seven units. When besides design, however that's defined, mm -hmm. I think it's about cars, far not necessarily the traffic, but just what the cars look like and how much that dominates, which you guys did a good job in the design so side. The parking but, and the driveways and all that stuff. Yeah. It Which again, we partially get from you done already. You partially get from subdivision regs, but you know. Right. Are we talking only essentially about Ward Three? I mean, well, no. This this affects. Um, I mean, urban residential C. Actually, would. Right. Yeah. So, um, Ward Three is not the only ward that has urban residential C. So, right. urban residential C surrounds downtown you know, Northampton. So. But Chris Street or goes out Elm lots Street that could be developed out like that. Right. Chapel Street is is URC. That's URB. Actually, I think the pushback was certainly primarily yeah. Ward. Right. You know, yeah. and the other concern that came up in the process in terms of the one big site is the Smith College Fort Hill, not the Lyman Estate, right. which actually happens to be um, Ward Three anyway. Um, okay. uh, it's not partially in Ward Four. I think Lyman Road's the boundary. Okay, huh. it is. It, it, it just seems like we had design standards for the city as a whole, and then we had some pushback on in this area for this size project, which we made modifications for, which were generally accepted, and it went through, and there was just a, some a hesitancy about that area and those size projects that they just pushed back again. Everything is good except for this, still don't feel right, send it back, but really don't know why. And so now we're left with fixing something, but we don't know does it does it really need fixing or, or what is it what is our charge what are we, what are we trying to do because they didn't really many of them want anything to be oh, I understand that. in there and that's why that. this is so complicated. So just there's three broad approaches without getting any details. One is in essence do nothing. You know, um, the second is very measurable standards like you sort of have already, but you know, more measurable standards that I could go through and easily know if I meet or don't meet. And the third, because this is a special permit, is this is not the measurable standards, but enough to give you feedback that, you know, whenever we look at a building, we're going to look at how the building fits the neighborhood in much more detail than the existing special permit language. At the moment, three sounds like the most appealing, but when we're actually sitting here doing one, it's going to not feel that way because I want you want a criteria. To, I want criteria to, to know where I belong on, yeah. on the issue. Well, I mean, one of the things that we could do is sort of look at, um, you know, look at maybe some pieces that were missing or that you all had decided on the first cut not to um, undertake and then and figure out, you know, a couple of ways to... Um, to potentially incorporate something and it's not and it clearly that the charge isn't that you have to make a change but it's I think to investigate is this do you feel that there is enough in place um, for those special permit approval um, criteria or does it need a little bit of tweaking or does it need a lot of tweaking <laughs> so the, the other effort we're doing which may or may not be useful for this but so we committed to do work with the neighborhood and sort of think about what are the important character defining features for the Fort Hill campus for, for the Lyman estate um, which may or may not end up resulting in, in thinking about regulations and so you could we could do that kind of approach let's go you know go back and ask some of the people who oppose this to sort of say okay let's not talk about density because the zone talks about what's allowed 
but let's talk about if that happened, what are the character defining features that we'd want to respect and keep? I, I think I'd be more inclined to do something like that where we, we, we if we're going to add more measurable standards, then A, do nothing, or B, uh, further restrict the leverage that we have with a special permit. You know, to me, the special permit is broad range, and that gives us a lot of latitude. But if, if we if we confine the language in the special permit to say, well, we mean this, A, B, and C, that seems to unnecessarily limit limit us. You know what I mean? I think the language is purposely vague in a special permit to give us some leeway because we don't have any leeway in site plan right. approval. I think it's true. I think it may be too vague now. I think you'd be. I like that one. <laughs> Well, but there were some um, new standards put into place in this package that weren't in the special permit criteria, approval yeah. criteria previously. So I don't think it's going to be the same level of vagueness as what's on the books for other special permits. Right. But the the question is, could we add a, f you know, it sounds like you don't want to be too specific because the vagueness helps in the sense that if something might just, you know, no, despite the best efforts for design, if it really feels like it's not functioning on that property, then the answer is denial. Right. And you still want to have that leverage because you don't, you know. You right. I don't want an applicant to say, you can't deny because here's the criteria and right. I've met it all. Right. Even though it doesn't feel right to the board, I don't want to be forced to have to approve it, you know, because what used to be, I just think we lose leverage with the more specific language. But if you go back to the the who's ever pushing back and find out what what is it what what do you want to see and we come up with one or two more design standards that we're all comfortable with and we don't think is too specific or limiting then I don't see the harm in that uh, I'm hesitant to send you off to do work with architectural design standards that have to do with the look of a neighborhood though I don't think that from what I heard of the discussion that wasn't a problem and I don't think that'll be the solution well, right. We purposely try to stay away from right. specific design, you know, architectural design standards. So, so think of three potential standards. Design standards, like we have downtown, that's the architectural standards. More sort of form-based code type standards. So not what the building looks like and what the appearance is, but how close the street is, the it's layout, how far back the is layout. the layout. Of it. And then the equivalent for everything else, the parking. You, you did some of this for the parking in the current rules, but the same thing at a bigger scale. You know, what's the goal for hiding parking or not hiding parking for doing it? So it sounds like you wouldn't want the first one, the architecture, right. but maybe you'd want the layout, the form, and the, uh, both of the buildings and of the site. I just feel, I mean, I feel like we addressed that. We went into yeah. so much detail on that, which I was very happy to do. I think that those are really good changes. So I'm, so, I'm kind of at a loss as to what more can Because it could be different yeah. for a bigger piece of property. So think of the whole Lyman estate. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you gave a lot of feedback about a relatively small property, but is the vision for Lyman, I'm making this up, you know, a block, you know, that matches the neighborhood to the south, mm -hmm. you know, a block where the blocks are 400 feet long, or is the vision more of a campus type appearance? Mm -hmm. We don't really have any guidance to right. give somebody for that. Right. But to go back, I think I agree with both Mark and Jen, I mean, you know, we put these things in place, and it, it, uh, you know, I, I feel like we might be leaning towards overreacting to a very specific circumstance criteria, and react to that. But then that's going to have that's going to ripple out over you know who knows what. I mean, and right. I think you're right. Every time you say what you don't want, by default, you're also saying what you do want. And I, I, I don't know. I, I would go back to your of your three choices. I would probably choose the first one and do nothing and see how this works. Because uh, I, I would just be, I would be hesitant to, to overreact to a just a what is what well, as I recall the conversation and following you know a very particular and a very specific circumstance that people were concerned about. Grant, will a city council pass? this uh, zoning thing without the provision that uh, it's passed it's passed with why a is it back before us then? well because there's a moratorium until july of next year 
and the more the purpose of the moratorium is to have that further conversation whatever that conversation ends up being to, but to give time for there to be more discussion and then it'll sunset the, the moratorium will go away and the ordinance stays and I think in good faith we need to I mean not do not choose to do nothing right now to right. try to figure out those things yeah, so right. I'm, I'm I'm certainly okay with getting more feedback I agree with Jen I, I it took us two and a half years or whatever to go through that process and I thought we addressed at first pass I thought we addressed those uh, particular concerns but if we didn't and and more information is brought forward that we feel the need to respond to that's fine if not we can just say you know what I, I think we're happy with what we did and, and do not so maybe does it make sense to put it on an agenda as a public meeting to ha and to get feedback from people who are concerned about this I mean because I don't really know I don't I hear what you're saying about Lyman, but that's not where the pushback came from. The pushback came from right. the War Three properties. I think it certainly makes sense to put this in a later meeting and, and reach out to the neighborhood, whether that neighborhood, whether that's a formal planning board meeting uh -huh. or a different kind of workshop sure. or something. Yeah. Whichever, yeah. Just some opportunity to get the feedback yeah. so yeah. we really understand what people want. Yeah, I mean, because if Anne's right that this is really just we want to block any development, I understand that on an emotional level, but that's not right. something we can address. Anybody else? Is that enough direction? Mm -hmm. Okay. Last up, uh, subdivision standards revisions. Let me start. Executive summary. Yeah, we didn't want to give you the detailed languages. First, subdivision, <laughs> do you think zoning isn't the sexiest thing? <laughs> subdivision regs are really good. <laughs> um, so we just wanted to sort of go through in the big picture. So we haven't revised our, we haven't had a subdivision at all since the recession. We have subdivisions right. going forward. Well, it was already in process, but right. yeah, we haven't. I mean, State Hospital, that's a little different creature, mm -hmm. but. Kensington, I think, was the last one, but that started <laughs> right, right. 15 years ago. Um, so our subdivision regs are a little bit out of date. Um, they have a lot of really good things in them, and, and they're out of date in two things. One is just some things have changed. The other, I think, has been a sea change at DPW. So things that DPW was very resistant on eight years ago, whenever we last did our regulations, they're now much more supportive of doing. So we want, we want to take advantage of that and come back for, for looking at this. Um, and, and so things which we're out of date, just as we had markers. So we, we require basically um, put curbs in every site. And the water gets, gets channeled into a catch basin and then goes out usually into a detention pond. Um, and we don't want the old country drainage where the water just runs off because that creates erosion. But so when we last the rules eight years ago, whenever it was, we said we're considered low impact development. We drop the curbs, you, you run the water off and you do rain gardens and you treat it. And we thought that's great. You know, we're really doing cutting edge. And all the developers looked at it and said, I don't want to figure this out. What I like about the subdivision regs is it's a cookbook. Even if it's a bad cookbook, I know exactly what it takes to get a permit. And so even though you were allowing LID, and we were one of the first communities to allow it, not a single person took advantage of it because they'd have to figure this out. And so we're trying to get to the next step and start talking about LID. So that's the big one, and that's one of the big places where both the standards have changed. We now actually have other people we can plagiarize from, and DPW is totally on board for this. So that's the first one. Um, although we may actually not find a lot of LID takers, just so you know, because it's really easy to do an LID in a suburban area, we have 150 feet of frontage. Now that a lot of our subdivisions are 50 feet of frontage, you just you can't necessarily right. do. It. But so so that's one big one. Um, the energy piece, uh, again, you know, staying on the hand, we've been pushing this. So thinking about what are things that we can do, and we're limited. Subdivision control does not give us a lot of tools. But for Kensington Estates, you guys push them to think about the roads so they were due east, west, or north, south, so you can get the best solar layout. For the state hospital, you've begun being flexible about street trees, thinking how do we do street trees that don't shade the, uh, the uh, PVs. Mm -hmm. um, and at the Energy Commission, we've begun thinking about LID lights. Um, so sort of thinking about all those things. And then when we hired Nelson Nygaard to do the Main Street, King Street charrette, one of the things that they said is, why do we have street lights that light the cars where they're driving? We really want street lights for intersection, crosswalks, which we do already, and for sidewalks. And LEDs fit that because it's a much more 
directed light. So, so those things generally for energy. The area that's a sea change, or this may also be sort of a, a work in progress. So I would expect number four to be the um, hardest negotiation in this process, is thinking about what are, what are the actual standards. We've done a lot in terms of granite curbs and concrete sidewalks. But we haven't done a lot in terms of what's the curb return. So you can imagine the sharper the curve, the closer an intersection is to a right angle, the shorter the pedestrian crossing distance is from one street to another. But the harder it is to send a fire truck or a bus or a truck through there. Mm -hmm. And so finding that right balance there, um, I think, again, that gets me an area of a lot of discussions. We have pretty narrow street widths, narrower than a lot of communities. Um, but we may still want to play with that. There may be some opportunities to allow even narrower streets. Mm -hmm. So that's the big, again, that's the most complicated. And then, for those of you who are my age or older, you may remember the old days when we were comfortable walking in the streets. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as cars got faster and crazier and more suburban areas, we began putting granite curbs in so cars can go up on the curb and concrete sidewalks. So this is whole shared streets concept, which says, we're not right. Um, which says, we, we do all this stuff because the cars are going ever faster. If we can physically get, if we can both physically, physically and in terms of cues, get cars to drive slower, then maybe we can put people back in the streets. So think about Smith College campus, where if there's a maintenance vehicle going down the sidewalk, you don't worry about getting killed because they clearly are deferring to you. What are the equivalent ways we can do that? Um, and we had a meeting with DPW. They were actually surprisingly supportive of it. These are we're talking for low, low volume. I don't mean I don't mean in a bad sense, but it's you know it's a very different concept. Yes. You're dealing with some real challenges for snow removal. Um, a lot of stuff that's easy without snow removal is really a challenge. Here. Um, Speaking of that, on a totally separate subject, but somewhat related, the the new People People's United Bank that opened, there was going to be a for a stretch for the length of the property. Uh, bollards or something to protect pedestrian or and that hasn't gone up yet is it still going to happen yeah I, I mean I haven't seen that they asked for their CO yet but okay. it must be temporary CO because yeah, they're temporary broke the ribbon today. Yeah, I got the grand opening yeah. invitation so I think it's today yeah. check there are I'm open. curious when I drive by just what I'm waiting for whatever it's going to be to come yeah. up just to see what people make of it. Cycle track, right? Right, it's right. Cycle track. So from Barrett, taking a right on the King, there was going to be like some demountable something for snow right. plowing in the winter. Yeah. But we'll we keep the bicyclists or pedestrians off. Yeah. So. I think those are the ones, yeah. Okay, sorry. So, so the sixth on the list is probably the stuff that's of least interest to all of us. Mm -hmm. But it's sort of it's the details, the stuff that, you know, when DPW is out in the trenches and things don't quite work. What are they finding? Don't yeah. undersell soil boring standards. Come on. <laughs> yeah, that's really sexy. That's right in it. Boring's even yeah. in it. <laughs> well, yeah, because I was um, the, the new office building at near the Clarion. You know, we worked on getting a drainage area associated with that building, and you know, there's standing water there now. Um, so, it, and that is exactly the reason, I think. I mean, I don't we, we find consistently that the engineers are really good at looking at soil borings and figuring out the structural, the, the weight bearing capacity of the roads, and maybe not so good at trying to figure out where the groundwater elevation is. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that, those are the kinds of things there. The other one that we're still exploring whether we even have the legal authority to do, but I think this is a big one, is under 4F. I just want to talk about this for a second. This is sort of thinking about how big a block size is. You know, a, a street that is 250 feet long is incredibly walkable and 400 feet in the Northampton context is reasonable. A street that's 1,000 feet between streets just feels like a, you know, it's a long way to walk for a square of a mile. Mm -hmm. um, and so thinking about block size, the problem is because we don't have big 100-acre sites to get developed, we're more likely to have a state hospital type approach where maybe you have a longer block, but you have a, a sidewalk that goes to the middle of the block. Mm -hmm. So at least for pedestrians and dog walkers, it feels shorter mm -hmm. if you're doing it. Um, and so we want to play with that. Yeah, old urban blocks used to be 800 feet, I think. Well, in New York City, they're 250 feet. Yeah. Um, 800 feet seems to for me. Long and narrow. I mean, the long way. Yeah. I mean, New, York's, New, New York is 250 feet by 500 feet. By 500 feet. Um, I was thinking of the long, I was yeah. thinking of the 500 feet end. Um, and most cities, New York's, most cities have 
250 feet short and 500 feet long. So in an urban context, you know, 350 or 400 feet mm -hmm. makes sense. You know, we have lower volumes, so it's hard to justify that sort of thing. But thinking about sort of what are those numbers for, for doing it. Um. So from us, are you looking for us to pick which one we want to dive into first? Or do you have a preference that? Well, I think, I think we want to do this comprehensively. Um, this is an easier process in the sense that only the planning board has to approve this at the end. Um, you have to hold public hearings and listen to comments. I, I want to see if there's anything here that you hate, things that you love, and <laughs> things that we're missing. Then you get, your language will come back to you in a couple months in more details, but this is sort of in our first cut. What are we missing, you know, what are things? Yeah, just as an example of the, under the shared streets, um, it, it goes back to what Wayne was saying earlier that, um, for LID, that we're encouraging um, developers to look at different ways of doing um, construction but they don't want to entertain that if it's not in the standards, if it requires a waiver or if it's not written down. So right. we've suggested many, many times for the North Campus at Village Hill that, that we should be doing some alternative design because it's supposed to be a village. Um, and they're reticent to do that because there's nothing on paper that says they can. And so to the extent that we do work through these things, you know, pretty... Um, at a good at a steady pace then potentially the next time a subdivision comes in which I think probably will be there before anywhere else we'll have you know some other criteria by which the applicants can follow yeah, I mean I don't know that any one jumps out more than another for me but some of these look look interesting I mean to I'd say they're boring, but some of them, I'd be interested to see what kind of uh, public input, how interesting it is to anybody else. But <laughs> Are these sorts of things being measured against sustainable Northampton standards? Um, in concept, sustainable Northampton isn't detailed enough. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly walkability, so that smaller blocks, mm -hmm. narrow, I mean, so no, no, nowhere does it say get rid of left turning lanes. But it certainly says, you know, design streets for all modes. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that pedestrian friendly one, and maybe the energy one, is pretty consistent. I would say the ones just really aren't addressed. Pro or con. Well, the other thing though, if we're talking about narrowing streets and other options, it also reduces, um, you know, heat island effects. Right. Mm -hmm. and Right, and stormwater. I mean, getting yeah. storm. yeah. one of the that's <clears throat> appealing to me about the pedestrian friendly streets is, is you all in the last 10 years have made our subdivisions much better. And I'm really pleased with where we've gone, but at the cost of making them more expensive to developers. I, I think there's some opportunities here that actually might lower the cost for housing um, and making things better mm -hmm. as well. So. Mm -hmm. okay. So do you need anything from us on the No, it's one, you know, so keep going and, and yeah. you'll come back with us and we'll just jump right in. And it sounds like we're going to have opportunity this fall yeah. or winter to do that. And this one's probably a slower process. We'll be doing, you know, we're probably going to spend another month before we send everything to the DPW. I think we want to get feedback from them before it goes back to you. Okay. So you're actually talking about clarifying. Clarifying with detail the options that a developer can use in order to get something approved. Right. So if I wanted to put in uh, recessed tree boxes, then th there would be uh, uh, parameters that I knew if I put it in that way, it would help me with my stormwater. Right. Okay. Right. I think it's just like the design standards with clarity. You know, every, everything's easier with clarity. With, with when it's ambiguous, either people don't want to go through the trouble. Or they're not sure, so it drives up the cost because they're hedging or something. And I think if we can be clear and still meet the goals that we've set up for ourselves, then that's fine. And, and just to be clear, some of these would be giving developers an option, like shared streets. We probably wouldn't require, but we tell people they could do it. Some might be required in terms of, of smaller diameter curb radius. We might just say, you know, you can't have a curb that's greater than 25 feet in radius, whatever it is, in some combination. And some are and some are easier for us. 
you know, the, the things like the, the shared streets, there's a lot of examples around the country now of shared streets, but almost all of them are coming from developers. I, we haven't been able to find a good stand, a good regulatory standard. Mm -hmm. Well, and as, as the person who thinks about those a lot, I'm beginning to think that they're not all they were cut out to be. I'm, I'm, it's almost like I'm beginning to think that in, in practicality, you can't do it. I know that it's, uh, it's a great concept and it, it had a lot of appeal, but when you actually try to do it, it's really hard. There's great examples of places where it's worked. Yeah. Or, but <laughs> okay. Okay, we're good. Uh, last up, we've got some minutes from our last meeting to approve September 12th. I move we approve the minutes? Second. I second. Second. All in favor? <laughs> Anything else? No? Do I hear a motion? Randy's out of the gate second. first, second. Bye. <laughs> All in favor? Okay, we're done. Thank you, everybody.